Hi. Well, welcome everyone to the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding. Um, you've braved the elements and come to hear an incredible talk. Um, today, I wanted to say I'm the uh, Melody Brown Birkins. I'm an, an adjunct professor in environmental studies, and I'm the associate director here of the Dickey Center. Have the privilege of working with the entire team, including Dan Benjamin, who couldn't be here today, and he asked if I would take the take the time. But he, of course, will be watching the video and has spent quite a bit of time with your distinguished speaker today. Um, Today you'll be hearing from uh, Philip Short, who is our Magro Family Distinguished Fellow in International Affairs. I want to take a quick moment to let folks know that the uh, this is a new thing for the Dickey Center. This is a new uh, Distinguished Fellowship. Um, as of last spring, we had uh, Ambassador Johnny Carson. Uh, here is our first Magro Family, uh, Magro Family Distinguished Fellow in International Affairs. That's now fo followed by Philip Short. And in the spring, we will have uh, Jake Sullivan. Um, who is already here as a Montgomery Fellow, and he will take on that role as well in the spring. So incredible uh, work and uh, scholarship done uh, by the Magro Family Distinguished, or supported by the Magro Family Distinguished Fellowship in International Affairs, and that's made possible by the Magro Family. Uh, Tony Magro serves on our board, and I just wanted to say a thanks to that. It lets the Dickey Center do even more in these spaces, and it will continue to grow. Today, we are here to hear from Philip Short. Um, a, a brief bio, I won't spend too much longer because he will have a, a wonderful talk for you, but he was born in Bristol in 1945 and educated at Sherburne and Queen's College in Cambridge. He worked for the BBC for 30 years as a foreign correspondent, initially in Central Africa and then in Moscow, Beijing, Paris, Tokyo, and Washington. In 1997, he spent a year teaching comparative politics at the University of Iowa, and he now lives with his wife and daughter in southern France. I didn't ask exactly where. Uh, quite far in the south, near the sea. <laughs> um, his first book, A Life of Malawi Leader Hastings Banda, was published in 1974. The Dragon and the Bear, a comparison between China after Mao and the Soviet Union after Stalin, followed in 1982. His bio biography of Mao Zedong was published in the United States in 2000 and has been widely regarded as the definitive account of the life of the Chinese leader. A revised edition incorporating new archival material, Mao, The Man Who Made China, was published in London in 2017. He has also published a biography of the Khmer Rouge leader, Pol Pot, and a life, and a life of the French president, Francois Mitterrand. Quite a set of folks to study. And we now get to hear him speak about uh, the current president of the United States, Donald Trump. I'm looking forward to this talk. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Melody. Um, Dan is not here, as, uh, as we, we just heard. Um, he initially, ah, are we getting a, I guess that one needs to go off. Well, I turned this off here. Let's see if I did it incorrectly. Muted. We will turn it all the way off, though. Because it's going to go it howling round in circles. Let's see what I can do. <laughs> Sorry, technology. <laughs> Keep going, and I think I, I will at least get a chance. Are you going to mute me, or are you going to mute you? I, this is muted. Um, I can be muted, too. <laughs> it's hard work, but I can. Not my expertise, but I think. I think you've got it. I think you've got it. Great. Um, I know I was saying, Dan, Dan originally suggested I give this talk in the fall. And uh, I said, no. Um, I, I, this, is, this is the kind of talk I would like to give really at the last possible moment, just before I get on the plane, because, well, I don't, I don't even need to tell you why. I mean, it, it's such a terrible subject, such a difficult subject, and I'm certainly going to say things which you won't agree with, uh, and metaphorically or otherwise, you will wish to throw brick bats and rotten tomatoes and bad eggs. So I th thought the last possible minute, but I do notice that Dan is not here. I'm here. But he's not. <laughs> now, I wonder if he thinks something ugly is going to happen. And <laughs> perhaps the, the, best, uh, the, the, the best answer is discretion. Um, it is sensitive. And curiously enough, the sensitivity came up even before I arrived in this room because we discussed what to do in the poster. And we've got a poster which shows Trump kind of looking like little Jack Horner sat in the corner. You know, what a good boy am I? Uh, he, he's been at the cream. He's so pleased with himself. But there, are, there were other ways of doing this. And we did kind of think 
if this will work. Well, he said it would work. Ah, there it is. So should we do something more like this? Um, because Trump as caricature, um, to most Europeans, Trump is a caricature. Uh, is that fair? I mean, should we, should we look on him as a caricature? Uh, you could say, well, Trump isn't fair to other people. Why should we be fair to him? But I don't think we have to descend to that level. Um, 62 million Americans voted for him, uh, some of them probably holding their noses, some of them because they hated Hillary, uh, all kinds of reasons, but the, the, it's a big number. Uh, he didn't come from nowhere. Um, he is an authentic reflection of a certain America, an America which you may not like, or you may like. I mean, it's up to you to decide. But there is a reality there. And a caricature, to be fair, always does reflect a reality. So uh, a caricature, yes. Um, I would argue in a minute, an aberration, no. He is a reflection of a certain reality, whether we like it or not. I guess I ought to say at the beginning of this uh, where I stand. Um, many people regard Trump as a, as a loathsome individual. I'll ha hold up my hand. Yes, uh, I, I think he personally, I think he's the pits. But just because he may be a, an unpleasant individual in many people's views doesn't mean he's always wrong. And uh, one of the things which is, uh, I won't say upset me, but has disappointed me, is the kind of lynch mob mentality which has developed, particularly in the mainstream American press, which holds very consistently that Trump can never do anything right. It's kind of a mirror image of Fox News and Breitbart. Uh, one side demonizes him, the other side praises him. Neither side is discriminating and actually tries to figure out, well, why is this guy there? I mean, you know, there must be a reason. Um, what does he represent? And are some of the things which he says actually sensible? You see, I said I'd annoy you all. And I'm, I'm trying my best. <laughs> um, it's easier for me to say things like that than it is for you. And it's the old business of, of the trees in the forest. Um, you see the trees because you're living among them much more clearly than I do. Uh, I'm not in the middle of, of, of the trees. I'm not surrounded. I don't see them as well. But being outside, I sh at least should be able to see the forest a little more clearly. Um, I confess that uh, over the Atlantic, there's often a lot of fog. <laughs> it's not always as easy as it might seem. Um, another key point before we go on, uh, we are the same family. Europeans and Americans, you know, we're basically on the same side. Uh, we share the same values, or at least we pay lip service to the same values. Uh, we share a a Judeo-Christian culture. And I think that's true whether you're a, a, a Buddhist or an atheist or whatever. The, the society in which we live uh, upholds or tries to uphold Judeo-Christian values. We believe in the same kind of political system. Uh, we, should, we believe in the same or similar freedoms. Similar, not always the same. But basically, we are on the same side. So in what I'm going to say, because I will inevitably be making certain criticisms. This is, as others see us, America in the age of Trump. Uh, they are crit criticisms or observations which are made from someone who is actually part of the same family as you. Europeans and Americans are. But being basically on the same side doesn't mean we're completely on the same side. <laughs> um, and there are disagreements. Uh, we do see things in, in different ways. And I think in, in Europe now, there's growing pessimism about whether America is going to get its act together, whether you're going to uh, confront your contradictions um, and deal with these rent wrenching internal conflicts um, that uh, are so evident, both to you and to those who look from outside at America. The other day, I read a piece by George Will, um, who is one of my favorite 
uh, you know, conservative commentators. I think he speaks, says, says a lot of good sense. And he quoted Mark Twain. It's a story I should think most of you know. Um, Mark Twain and another writer were coming out, uh, and it was pouring with rain. And the other guy said, do you think he's going to stop? And Mark Twain says, well, it always has. <laughs> and the point of, of the story was that you know, Trump also will pass. <laughs> the rain will stop. But it doesn't answer the question of how long it's going to rain before it does stop. And how long, in other words, the age of Trump, what I'm calling the age of America, uh, the America in the age of Trump is going to continue. Um, European leaders really did think, to begin with, that Trump was an aberration, a kind of blip, and he'd go away. I think very, very few Europeans actually feel that now. Um, the prospect is rather that the problems that America has uh, will cross the Atlantic, as they so often do. My mother used to say, when America gets a cold, Europe uh, when America sneezes, Europe, Europe gets a cold or gets flu. Um, we tend to pick up a lot that comes from you, and some of it goes the other way. Uh, and indeed, I think, I think uh, what, what you have been experiencing, we are already experiencing. It's already crossed over. Technology is much quicker now. <laughs> used to take four or five years for things to cross the Atlantic. Now they go much, much faster. Um, and both of us are confronted by problems which have been growing slowly over time. They didn't come out of nowhere, and they're not going to go away soon. Uh, I'm actually less concerned about Europe than I am about America uh, for two reasons. Because uh, Europe, uh, back in the 1930s, exper had experienced very directly fascism. And that memory is still with us. You didn't. You were on the other side of the ocean. You, you didn't have it kind of up in your faces, so close up. I think that is, is quite a powerful factor. And also, Europe is a whole bunch of countries. And if one has a nervous breakdown, uh, there may be a little sanity in some of the others. You are one country. So if, if you have a collective mental breakdown, uh, you don't have others to kind of counterweight. Um, and I, I'm talking about, uh, wait a minute, <laughs> I, I missed a page. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I'm not, not so bothered about Europe um, as with you. And even with you, you know, there'll be ups and downs. You may have a uh, really charismatic leader who comes next, someone in the mold of, of Jack Kennedy. Perhaps, it doesn't happen very often, but who knows. And if you have a leader who can inspire, then there'll be an up. But even then, the, I would argue these underlying problems are not going to go away. They're too deep, um, and they're not something which is here just temporarily. And we'll talk about that in a, in a moment. Um, what are these underlying causes? I think there are three. The first is that ever since the Second, the Second World War, so for 70 years, America has been preeminent. In fact, since the end of the Cold War, you've been the only world power. But as Christa Freeland, the Canadian foreign minister, said recently, I'm sure you've all read this, and it's an interesting comment, preeminence does not go on forever. Uh, there's the old Chinese classic which starts, uh, empires wax and wane, states cleave asunder and coalesce. You know, there is a natural process there. Um, some states become more powerful, they reach a peak, and they then become less powerful. And that has been the law ever, all through human history, and it's going to apply to you too. It applied to Britain. And I talk about Britain as a, as a Brit. Um, in, uh, I, the parallel, I think, is very striking between the United States um, over the last few decades and late 19th century Britain. We both espoused, and were proud to, a civilizing mission. You know, Britain had colonies. We had an empire. Uh, Britain would bring the, the rule of law. It would bring Westminster-style democracy, proper administration, and everything else to the colonized peoples. You would bring democracy. Uh, you weren't so good at colonies. You, you, you had the Philippines, um, but you didn't have them on the kind of scale we did. But after World War II, 
you set out to promote American values all around the world. You um, installed where you could or promoted pro-American regimes to you know, halt the spread of communism. And then after the, second, after the end of the Cold War, uh, that became regime ch change and inculcating democratic values, especially in the Middle East and the territories of the former Soviet Union and uh, uh, Eastern Europe. And I remember 20 years ago, <laughs> University of Michigan, giving a talk where I tried to convince them that actually there were big parallels between um, 19th century Britain and 20th century America. Uh, it was in, in the 1990s. And I, I must admit, I failed. Uh, they were not at all convinced. I mean, this was late 1990s. It was the time when uh, America was absolutely at the peak of its power difficult for Americans to imagine that there could conceivably be a parallel with, you know, little Britain that had kind of become a second-rate power and it was not at all in the same league. I wonder if it's different now, and I'd be interested to hear your comments, whether you think, whether you can in, imagine that sort of process, um, uh, that sort of parallel actually applying. Um, I'm not suggesting the end result will be the same, but I'm suggesting there is a similar process at work. Um, the motor of that change is not just the rise of China. Uh, it's also the growing economic weight uh, of other countries which were formerly in the developing world, which means, or mean collectively, that America will have a smaller, relatively smaller slice of the global economic cake. I don't think there's any way that's not going to happen. You can already see it. Um, and that creates anxieties and fears, discontents, which Trump has very cunningly tapped into. Um, you know, that slogan, make America great again, well, it implies America is no longer great, which implies that actually there has been a process of decline. And Trump is the guy who promises that he's going to fix that. And it's that feeling of decline which drives... Trump's support. Now, you may say, and people have said to me, oh, but the opinion polls show that Americans are not actually concerned about these, you know, these huge geopolitical changes I'm talking about. They are driven by nostalgia, uh, by a feeling that there are fewer opportunities than there used to be, that the middle class or lower middle class or the working class are not um, able to improve their situation in the way they were, that America is no longer what it was in the 1950s. In other words, it's the same thing as in Britain. The nostalgia, Brexit, which is a suicide mission. Uh, Brexit is because fundamentally people are looking for uh, how they can get back a Britain which no longer exists and which never can exist again. Um, but they want it. And so uh, voters do what they always do in these circumstances. They look for a simple, reassuring answer uh, to a complicated problem. It's Brexit in Britain. It's Trump here in America. So first underlying cause, which is not going to go away, is geopolitical, geopolitical change. And geopolitical change, you know, for humanity as a whole, it's a pretty good thing. It's, uh, it, it's in the natural order of things. Some countries get stronger, others become weaker. Um, and just to go back to the British example again, you've got to ask yourselves, well, how long did Britain take to get over the decline of its, or the period of declining from its peak? It's at least 100 years, if you look back. The, the peak of Britain was, was around the time of the First World War, just before. And I think um, the, the la Brexit actually represents the last kind of spasm, destructive spasm of Britain coming to terms with a decline which it could do nothing about. So if you're, lo if you're, if you're looking at how long a process it's going to be, even if things move quicker now, for all kinds of technological reasons, it's, it's a very long, slow process. And I'm not suggesting America is kind of finished or going downhill, not at all. I mean, going downhill, maybe very slowly, but certainly not finished, certainly not dead. Um, in 40 years' time, I suspect America will still be uh, the most powerful country in the world. 
it's not happening overnight, but there is, there is a transition and it's begun. The extent of your preeminence is relative, in relative terms declining. And until Americans start accepting that, uh, which I think is not for, not for tomorrow, it's going, to be, it's going to be difficult to accept, no one, no one likes this kind of prospect, then the kinds of anxieties and discontent which Trump is homing in on are going to continue. Second factor, globalization. Globalization, again, uh, is very positive, and not just for, for multinationals. It's positive for people in the developing world, for Senegalese, for Guatemalans, for uh, you, you name it, they, Bangladeshis. Um, they have much greater opportunities than they would have had before. But if you're a Bangladeshi or a Senegalese, and you see, because you can now see through the internet, through improved means of communication, you see how much better life is in Europe or in America. And if you're determined, you're going to up sticks and want to move. So globalization is a fundamental cause of migration. And migration is a huge problem which nothing is going to stop. I mean, I do believe, uh, not just looking at the situation in America, but looking at the situation in Europe even more, migration is not going to be stopped by walls. You know, across the Mediterranean, how many tens of thousands of people have drowned trying to make the journey to Europe? Because Europe offers things which they don't have in their own countries. And build as many walls as you like, it's not going to, it's not going to happen. It's not going to stop it. Uh, it may make it more difficult. You haven't even thought about maritime <laughs> yeah. migration to the United States. You've got loads of coastlines. So have the countries that uh, people are, are, are leaving from. Uh, there are other ways of getting to you, and it's, it's really not going to stop. Um, there is only one real solution uh, to, to the problem of migration, and that is to improve uh, life in the countries which, from which people are leaving. And... It's actually in our interest to do so because those countries are our markets. That's where we're going to sell stuff. Um, it's, so it's not just a matter of doing it kind of as do-gooders, as a charitable cause to make life better there um, and to stop them <laughs> migrating to us. It's, it's also in our own interests. But governments hate it because it's very hard to explain to taxpayers, you know, why, why are we helping these people over there when you, we've got such problems here? Um, and I think it's probably not going to happen. I don't, I don't think we will have, unless governments suddenly have a kind of blinding vision in Europe and here, I don't, I don't think we are going to have the kind of effort that is required, would be required, to stop international migration. So it's going to get worse. So a third factor is kind of piling in with those two, climate change. And I'm not going to get into the argument of whether it's man-made or not. It doesn't really matter. What I think we can all agree on is that the climate is changing. Um, and changing crop patterns, rising sea levels, they are going to increase uh, migration because they're going to make certain areas uninhabitable. A rare note of optimism, I think America will eventually uh, climb on board the, the, um, the anti-climate change bandwagon. You, 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 the, it's, it's aberrant. And a lot of big American companies are very well aware that this is a huge problem. The American military is certainly very well aware that climate change is real, and it's a huge problem for them. So you have these three factors. Geopolitical change, which is coupled with globalization, indirectly induces anxiety in large parts of the US population. And then the infernal couple, migration and climate change. That's one of the key reasons for saying that the age of Trump is not just a blip. It's going to be with us, because these are factors which are not going to go away. Um, and absent a kind of black swan event, you know, a nuclear war or, or, or something of that nature, which we all hope is certainly never going to happen, um, absent something absolutely cataclysmic like that. These are probably the two issues, um, migration and climate change, which are going to affect not just our future, but our children's and grandchildren's future more than any others. 
So those are the big issues. But I would argue that America actually is kind of missing the point over some of the, what relatively, are the smaller issues. Um, there's a uh, kind of analogy from, from China back in the 1930s. China in the 1930s was facing two things, a civil war between the communists and the, uh, the nationalists, and uh, Japanese occupation. And Chiang Kai-shek, the nationalist leader, said, the Japanese are a disease of the skin. The communists are a disease of the heart. By which he meant, we, we can not worry about the Japanese occupation until we've actually got rid of the communists. And of course, he failed. But it was a dis distinction which was worth making. And I think it applies uh, to America. I think you are concentrating on diseases of the skin and ignoring diseases of the heart. Diseases of the, of the skin, for example, the threat from Russia. Russia has the GDP of New York State. It does. It's no exaggeration. Economically, it is uh, way down the list. Yet, sure, it has nuclear weapons. We talked about a black swan event, and I'm not, I'm not diminishing, I'm, I'm not you know, kind of passing over the, the, the threat of conceivable nuclear war, but absent that, it's very difficult to see how Russia is really a threat to your vital interests. I mean, is Ukraine a vital US interest? Sure it is if you're a Ukrainian American, but for the rest of, of, of America, for America as, a, as a, a, an entire nation, it isn't. It isn't for Europe even. It's not a vital interest. Um, another is the rise of China. We've talked about it a little bit. That's also in the natural order of things. Sure, we, we get exercised uh, about being challenged, uh, and especially when it comes from what has been for so long a developing country. But uh, it, it's a relationship that needs to be managed and managed intelligently, but it's not an existential threat. You know, countries do wax and wane. Um, so the diseases of the skin are what take up all our time, and the diseases of the heart, what do I mean by that? Not just migration and climate change, but also the, the wounds in the American social and political fabric. Racism clearly is one. And when Europeans uh, read about um, uh, unarmed black people being uh, shot by policemen and then acquitted by American juries, we kind of scratch our heads and are completely unable to understand. And I'm not, I'm not, don't think I'm being kind of broad brush about this. You've got a lot of decent policemen. I'm not saying they're all you know, racist killers um, uh, at all. And racism is pernicious everywhere. There's racism in Europe as well as here. It's not, I'm, I'm not making that case. But those jury trials could not happen in Britain or France. We can talk about the reasons they couldn't happen. I'm happy to talk about them, but they could not. And they are something which really Europeans find very shocking about your your society. <coughs> in general, the racial divide in America is much, much greater for historical reasons, sure, than it is in Europe. <coughs> I was struck by that um, when I came to Washington for the first time 20, 22 years ago. And I saw there were virtually no biracial couples on the streets. Um, and in London, you know, there are probably as many black-white couples as there are white-white couples or black-black couples. <coughs> the mixing is very much greater. And I thought, hey, this country is supposed to be a melting pot. Well, it, it isn't. Uh, and the, again, these things have changed. They've improved a little bit, um, but they haven't, they haven't changed fundamentally. <coughs> Sorry. Um, I actually, when I first came to Washington, I went to Southeast and places like that. You know what it reminded me of? The only place I'd been that was like it was South Africa, Johannesburg, uh, during the apartheid period. Because you would go from one street, which was completely inhabited by black, black folks, and two or three streets away, completely inhabited by white, white folks. I know there are historical reasons for this. Um, and every country has its history. But I'm simply, as others see us, these are things which Europeans 
are slightly shocked by. And then there's US democracy. Uh, the US is a democracy. I'm, I'm not disputing that. It's uh, a very important democracy. But, there had to be a but, um, when money plays quite such a big part in your, in your system, your political system, that, that we find a bit difficult to take. If you have to have a billion dollars to be elected president, it's quite a lot of money. I mean, how, how is that democratic? And then there's the, the electoral college. You go, okay, uh, you, you, you have um, a, an electoral college system. It does lead to people being elected, as in this case, but not just this case, it, people being elected uh, with fewer votes than their opponents. 200 years ago, I can quite see that may have been a necessary safeguard. But now? But it's in the Constitution. Another thing which surprises many outsiders, you treat your Constitution as holy writ. Other countries change their constitutions. French are on their fifth, and there are always talks about the sixth. Britain doesn't have one, so we don't have to change it. But you do really hang on to that constitution that your founding fathers wrote, and which was wonderful 200 years ago, but it's kind of difficult to see that it's necessarily perfectly adapted to the situation in which you're living in the 21st century. Um, I could go on. No democratic system is perfect. But when Europeans uh, you know, look at America, these are the things that stand out. And one other factor, you know, white Americans, I put that in inverted commas, will no longer be uh, the majority in, uh, what is it, 20, 30, 40, 20, 30 years' time. And I wonder how you're going to get over that. Um, it, that also will be a difficult transition to make uh, psychologically. Um, I've been kind of grumbling. I've been the grumbling European, so I want to counterbalance that and absolutely sincerely by saying that you ha also have qualities which we have lost, and we are aware of that. These are qualities which uh, Europeans recognize, admire, and envy. Um, the one which always strikes me most, and I'm sure most of you absolutely take it for granted, is the can-do attitude. You know, it's Barack Obama's, yes, we can. It's a little engine that could. It's all this stuff which you might say, okay, that's for kids. But it's actually there. <laughs> and for a European, it's very striking. Uh, if you have a new, new idea in Europe and you try to push it, everybody will say to you, oh, we haven't done that before. That's going to be difficult. And they'll have a whole list of reasons why it's really hard to do. If you have a new idea here, people say, well, let's try. It's a totally different mindset. And that's one of your greatest qualities. Um, new ideas do get traction in Europe. I, I'm not, not being completely broad brush over this. But it's a lot easier here. Um, and resistance to change in Europe is really strong. Brexit is one example. The gilets jaunes, the, the yellow jackets in France, are another absolutely classic example. Macron wishes to bring about changes which are so obviously necessary. And everyone's out on the street burning cars saying, no, you can't. It's, um, it's, it's very different. Um, Americans are much more positive. Maybe it comes from the pioneering spirit. <laughs> I don't know, you've had to struggle against the odds. But wherever it can, comes from, I think it's, it's in a way an attribute of a young country, a young, confident country. Europe is kind of weighed down by its history. Um, you're not. European countries are mature. I'm not saying you're immature, but you certainly have the, you know, <laughs> Um, I wouldn't dare. You would really all lynch me. <laughs> but um, you have uh, the energy and confidence of, of youth. And a question I ask myself is whether that perhaps is now beginning to change. Um, 
I remember thinking years ago, 40 years ago, when I was in Moscow, that if ever America lost its kind of certitude, its sense of confidence in itself, uh, then that would be, yes, a sign that it was, in inverted commas, growing up, becoming uh, more mature, but also the beginning of decline. And, uh, you know, countries are like people. Uh, we become wiser, or at least we hope we do as we get older. Uh, that's not always true. Um, but we also become less robust. And the core of your national sense of confidence, I think, is this idea of uh, exceptionalism, American exceptionalism. Uh, America should lead. America is a model that others should follow and that America should promote its values. Um, you probably don't notice this so much, and in fact, I didn't until I really started listening and thinking about it. But this is a constant theme. It's in every American newspaper. It's in every politician's discourse. My students, when we talk in class, they will come out, uh, up with American leadership just quite naturally in the court. You know, it's something which is hardwired, mixed metaphors. It's in, in the, your DNA, and it's a given. I don't think it's a given to Europe and perhaps much of the outside world anymore. It was during the Cold War. I mean, during the Cold War, we were actually very grateful to have American leadership. Um, it's uh, something that was certainly accepted. But since the Cold War ended, and you had the neocons, people like Dick Cheney, who, who talked about American exceptionalism as though uh, it was the ultimate good, and Americans were inherently virtuous. You were cho the chosen people. And what happened? Fiasco in Iraq and this terrible war in Afghanistan that's been going on and on and on. Um, that, uh, it's, I mean, why did it happen? I think it was partly triumphalism. It was partly hubris. It was the end of history. You remember that book by Francis Fukuyama, uh, The New World Order. America was a hyperpower. Uh, it was also, I think, and I would argue, and on my critical bent again now, short termism. And I do find that uh, an unfortunate characteristic um, that you, you don't really look beyond the next move. You don't look two or three mo moves down the road and think, well, what are the long-term effects of this? In exactly the same way as Americans tend to live, or many Americans live paycheck to paycheck. Europeans have savings and would be horrified if they had you know, the idea that they had just to get to the next paycheck. It's very rare in Europe. Um, Trump is more short-term than most, uh, but he has called into question some of the basic assumptions on which this doctrine of exceptionalism rests. And I think some of those assumptions need calling into question. OK, this is an outsider's view. You can look skeptically. <laughs> I think it's, this, this is a, very much a, an outsider's view. Um, for instance, NATO, you know, he's horrified the foreign, ex uh, for the foreign, and, uh, foreign policy and defense establishment by saying, do we need NATO? No, let's get rid of it. And I think you can make a very strong case saying, for saying, in America's interests, America ought to keep NATO. It's, absolute, it's been so useful to you over the years. Is it in Europe's in interests? That, I think, is a very different question. Because one of the problems has been that every time the Europeans showed a little bit of desire to create an independent defense force, Germany and France did in the 1990s, every time they've been slapped down. And America said, no, 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 you do that, then we'll pull out. We, you, you'll be duplicating what we do. We absolutely don't want it. Basically, you have wanted the European allies to be there, but you wanted to be the one calling the shots. And it's, it's a little bit short term as well, because if you really want the Europeans to pony up to their responsibilities, then you have to do what parents do, what adults do. You've got to say, OK, you're on your own. Do it. It's the old thing of you know, the birds 
with the baby birds in the nest, they're not going to learn to fly unless they're kicked out. And countries are not suicidal. If the Europeans were forced to look after their own defense, I have no doubt they would do so. But you have to force them. You know, no, no one is going to spend loads of money on making their armed forces stronger unless they have to. And uh, the argument, therefore, that NATO um, you know, should, should never end, but we should keep it forever, um, I, I think can be called into question. There's also the whole thing of NATO enlargement. You enlarge up to Russia's borders. Um, how would you like it to have Russian troops in Mexico or in, in Canada? Try and look at it from the other side. You, one can argue that actually much of what has gone wrong in the relationship between America and Russia, and it's a crucial relationship, has been self-reinforcing. The Russians have done one thing, you've then done something else, and it's made it worse, and uh, it's been a vicious circle. Um, there was, I mentioned the business of parents. There was a fascinating piece. Richard Cohen in the Washington Post um, wrote a couple of weeks ago. He said, nations like children crave predictability. They need to know the rules. The United States is like a parent. Other countries look to it for guidance and to enforce those rules. Well, I wonder if that's how you all see America's role in the world. I mean, it would make the hair of, of the Europeans and of most other countries stand on end. We don't want a parent. You know, we don't, we don't even need a leader of the free world anymore. In the Cold War, that made some sense. What is the free world? Free from what? Free from whom? It makes sense if you regard Russia as the great you know, successor of the Soviet Union trying to subjugate everybody else. But that's a pretty, pretty hard line to, uh, to, to try and make stick. Now, I suspect I've been over time. Have I? Um, I'm going to be in a minute. So let me, let me wind up reasonably quickly. There's <laughs> just one other thing um, about exceptionalism. And it, it, it's from uh, a guy called John Seifer. It's another quote I saw recently. John Seifer was a CIA official. He writes for lots of blogs. He's retired. He's very, very well respected. A little bit right wing. OK, fine. Uh, there's no problem with that. And he wrote this piece saying uh, it, it was outrageous that we should uh, even think there was any kind of moral equivalency uh, between America and Russia over things like Russian electro, election interference. And what he, he said was what's important is moral intent. In other words, if America tries to fix other countries' electoral systems or election results by underhand means, that's fine because we're doing it in a good cause. We are promoting democracy. If the Russians do it, it's evil. Um, so, you know, one side does it, fine. The other side does exactly the same thing, no. You know, you'd think that was a caricature, but I'm afraid it is an element that informs a lot of uh, the foreign policy establishment's thinking. Um, it seems to me crazy, but, but it's, it's something which uh, is quite widely believed. Um, I'll skip that. The last point, really, I want to make is that, and it's linked to exceptionalism and American leadership. And it's this, it's, it's America, the way America punishes other countries if they don't actually follow what America would like them to do. And uh, Iran sanctions is the most recent case where the Europeans have had the kind of European companies that are very reluctant to give up trading with, with Iran. And European governments uh, think the Iran, uh, Iran agreement was actually a good agreement and it should be kept. But the European com companies have had to jump through hoops uh, to try and avoid uh, tertiary sanctions from, from the United States because America would say, well, you can't, you can't do business in our market um, because you're, you're, you're trading with the, the Iranians. Um, that's kind of extraterritorial. And there are lots of other examples. It happened under Reagan. Reagan uh, wanted the Europeans not to have anything to do with a gas pipeline to Russia. 
and threatened sanctions of the same kind. Nikki Haley said, you'll remember, if you don't, at the United Nations, if you don't vote for us, then there are going to be conf- consequences. Um, this is all, you know, it's the schoolyard bully, I'm afraid. And for your allies, it's really hard to accept. You know, we can, it, it, it makes sense when enemies, when adversaries try to stop us doing things. But when our greatest ally, the United States, we're all in the same side, says, you've got to follow our lead, otherwise we'll, uh, we'll uh, use economic sanctions against you. Um, and this is not new. In the 1980s, Francois Mitterrand actually threatened to take France out of the G7 because he was so outraged by Reagan's insistence that everyone follow what America wanted to do. And, of course, it didn't happen, but there was a huge row within the G7. Read my book. <laughs> um, then the, uh, the other element of this, punishing things, it's also America's willingness to resort to war as uh, the kind of the, the resort, the recourse of, of uh, the, the policy of first resort. Um, you know, you fought a lot of wars. They haven't all been terribly successful over the last 70 years, put it that way. Some of them, the little ones, Grenada, <laughs> Panama, the first Gulf War where everyone supported you, yeah, that was very successful. But a lot of the others have actually produced you know, huge expenditure of blood and treasure for very, very little result. Um, I have talked to politicians, to businessmen, to um, cultural figures, to people like you and me in Europe, in, in many European countries. And I'm afraid one thing you hear rather often is that they are more afraid of, of America starting a new war than they are of any other country, including Russia, starting a new war. And that is said by Europeans who have seen what has happened in Ukraine. They, they worry John Bolton over Iran, for example. Um, they, they do worry about, about this. Um, and that's, I mean, it's, it's not something I would wish to say about America, but it, 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 is, um, it, it is an impression that you often give, that force comes first and diplomacy you're not so good at. Um, it's a very broad thing to say. You have been good at diplomacy in certain cases. I mean, it was you who, who brought about the, the first Middle East peace settlement between Israel and Egypt. Um, you, you, you've done a lot, but you have tended perhaps more even recently than before to use force. Um, I'm coming to the end of this. The last thought I want to give you is, you know, Barack Obama, you remember on American exceptionalism, he suggested that most countries felt exceptional. Do you remember? And people said, how can you say that? And I think he was wrong. Most countries don't feel themselves exceptional. You do. The Russians do. China does in a way. Britain used to. It doesn't anymore. France maybe culturally a little bit. But essentially, it's you and the Russians. And that's what makes, makes it always so difficult for you to to, to have a non-conflictual relationship with Russia. Um, what, was, what I noted about, about Obama, though, is he started to think about exceptionalism. He started to question it. And uh, people say, you know, America's not very good at introspection. But actually, you, you hear that word, introspection, more now than you used to. And I think maybe there is greater awareness, perhaps partly because of Trump, that you need to think about the kind of, of country that you've become. Uh, you need to think harder about it. Um, because in order to become a normal country, not a hyperpower or a superpower, but normal in inverted commas, in other words, a great power, but not a hegemonic power, a, a power that can exist, coexist with others, that recognizes that there will be growing powers like China um, and others in the world, this doctrine of exceptionalism you kind of have to overcome. As long as you think you're completely exceptional, it's very difficult to live as a normal country. Um, powerful normal, but still normal. How long is it going to take for that 
to sink in, that change to happen? Decades, I'm sure. Um, how many? Goodness knows. But the British experience is it's, a, it's very slow. Um, I, I don't think I'll be here to see it. I think our children will. Um, but it's going to be a very long, a very long period. And that's another, that's a fundamental reason I say Trump is not a blip. He reflects, he reflects things which are much, much longer, durable, more deep-seated. He's a bad moment, I grant you, uh, but he's part of, he's a symptom of the, these changes that we're going through. And I think all we can do is hope that uh, his successors uh, have the wisdom, uh, have the intelligence to, uh, and the convictions also, uh, to try and manage the confused and dysfunctional, uh, deeply polarized country that he, he's left behind, um, not that he will leave behind. We would hope he has left behind, but it hasn't happened yet. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to end on a bleak note, but let us now, in the time we have left, go to, go to questions. too little, much too little. Um, I mean, countries are thinking about it. Uh, China, for instance, is thinking about uh, climate change. And it's been taking some action on climate change, but to fill the vacuum left by America. It's for nationalistic reasons. There is no global body, uh, no group, which is really, really devoting energy to this, these things. And migration, hopeless. The Europeans are doing, you know, are not getting their act together at all. Um, America, zilch. No one, no one is addressing these things. And they are the fundamental problems that face us all. They're just not being dealt with. Very depressing. Uh, yes, lady. First of all, I just want to say it's delightful to see you in person. For many years, I've only heard you on the BBC, so <laughs> it's quite nice. Um, one thing that you didn't mention, which I found very different, I lived in England for 20 years, and um, I'd be interested in your perspective on the difference in uh, religious fervor in the United States versus oh, yeah. Europe. Um, it, it, to me, is such a striking um, in many ways, negative to uh, to the way we're approaching the world. So I'd be interested in your thoughts about that. Well, this, this would sort of reinforce my, my comparison between America today and 19th century Britain. 19th century Britain, people did have faith. So, you know, the church was very strong. Now, the, the, in, in Britain, religion is certainly not something you wear on your sleeve. You, you, you don't at all. Um, and church going, if you believe, it's kind of very personal. It's not, um, uh, I, I have always been struck um, driving through America by how many, how many small churches there are. You go up to Lyme and there's a lovely church in Lyme and you go out to the, towards the ski slopes, there's another church. You have churches everywhere and people go to them. Well, in the same way that you have your flags out, flagpoles outside your houses. That was, it would be pretty inconceivable in Europe. Um, Europe has, I said, we'd lost things. And one of the things that we certainly have lost is uh, faith, religious faith. Um, so many churches in Europe have been closed and tra transformed, you know, de desacralized and transformed into private, private residences. It's... Um, I mean, I think people should have the right to choose. You know, you either believe or you don't. You, it's, faith is a kind of gift. <laughs> it's not something you can, you can work on. Like, it's not like learning arithmetic. <laughs> um, it is it's, it's an, a, at a different level. But uh, it is absolutely true that Europe is much more agnostic or 
atheist than religious. It's true everywhere. So does that await you? I mean, will that be one of the signs that actually things are changing in America? As I say, it's, it's decades away. But one may, one may wonder whether your grandchildren's generation is going to be as religious, as imbued with faith as your generation is. Who knows? Uh, early on in your talk, uh, you had uh, uh, felt more concern about uh, us U.S. Uh, and the whole, all of the issues, Brexit and uh, mm. uh, the, the right wing, and uh, uh, rather than, uh, and you, you felt less concerned about Europe. Would you uh, can, would you also uh, ex extend that uh, to uh, Eastern Europe? Uh, the concern, uh, concerns about uh, uh, you know, democracy yeah. and, and and the like. Uh, I, I can see Western Europe, but I'm, I'm wondering about uh, Eastern Europe. Well, it's kind of a different issue. And when I'm talking about Europe, you, know, you put your finger on something. I was basically talking about Western Europe. Um, but you do put your foot, finger on a, a very interesting issue. Um, there, was, there was discussion right at the beginning uh, whether the East European countries should be admitted to the European Union. Um, uh, Mitron, for one, suggested that uh, uh, there should be a confederation, a call for a confederation of Europe, which would be a kind of halfway house. And of course, the East Europeans said, don't want anything remotely like that. And they ran to Washington and they said, hey, you hear what these Europeans are talking about? Put some pressure on them. We want to get in straight away. And America, naturally, for geopolitical reasons, wanted them to be part of, of Western Europe. Um, very understandable reasons. But there, there is a question. You know, Eastern Europe has had very, a very different experience, a very different history from Western Europe. And how well was it going to fit? Um, I think we're now see, seeing that actually there are quite big cleavages, um, particularly in Hungary. Uh, Hungary is probably the, the, the worst offender. Orban is um, running a very... Uh, dictatorial regime in Poland. Um, justice, the Justice Party is um, uh, trying to get its hands on so many levers of power. Uh, the Czech Republic, um, Slovakia, the, the old Visegrad group, these four, uh, are kind of moving, not exactly in, in together, but they, they are proving um, recalcitrant to many West European democratic ideals. Um, and the idea, Hungary in particular, the idea of accepting any kind of immigration uh, is absolutely out. Well, if you want to be part of a, of a bigger thing, you can't set your own rules and say, well, we, we like it because you're giving us lots of aid, but we're not actually going to follow the same rules as you. So I think this is a big problem. Now, should it's very difficult to, 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 I mean, there are two ways of looking at this. Will eventually the East Europeans accept West European standards? And so a period of pain for a larger Europe uh, is worth going through. Or are we going to reach the point where we have to say, well, I'm sorry, but you can't be members of this club anymore, you know, because you're screwing it up. Uh, that's not what this is about. Um, I think there is a, well, it's, it's very difficult to say which, which way it's going to go. <laughs> Anybody? Gentlemen. So, uh, because of your knowledge of China, a uh, very impressive book on Mao Zedong, I wonder if you would care to make some comment on the, how the rivalry between China and U.S. is going to play out. I know what it's a question. loaded question, but take it where you want to. Make it a short answer. You mean I've been talking enough? I can, I can, I can, I can just. <laughs> um, it, it's actually it's a question which is very much related to everything we've been talking 
to, you know, how is America going to react to the growth of, of powers like China? How is it going to be to accept a multipolar world? Because a multipolar world is, I might even say it's here, but it's certainly on the way. Um, you know, crystal balls? I don't have them. <laughs> I, I, I find it very difficult to judge. Um, no, I, I, I just don't want to predict because so much depends on America. A certain amount depends on, Ch on China, I agree. But if America is only going to be satisfied with a complete sort of Chinese surrender, I don't think that's going to happen. And so you're going to have continuing conflict. My guess is you're going to have conflict for quite a while. Now, the question is whether it will be kept within manageable proportions, because if it isn't, it's going to damage the American economy as much as it damages everyone else. This is the problem. You know, it's fine to say, OK, we'll be tough and we'll, um, you know, we'll show America first. But who gets damaged? You're going to get damaged. And that doesn't always seem to register. So we just have to see how it plays out. Anybody else? Young lady? Ah, this gentleman. Um, I'd like to hear a little more about the issue of migration as a problem. Because you talked about one solution is us uh, spending money to prevent it by building up the underdeveloped countries. Why do you see migration now as a problem where um, like in the early 1900s in this country, we benefited greatly. And even before that, we had um, immigration from Asia help us build our railways. And we've seen migration like um, throughout the world, you know, India to East Africa, China to, um, you know, Southern Asia. Why is migration a problem, especially in this country now where we need unskilled labor in health care, in agriculture, and given the demographics here, and especially in Europe, why is Italy that desperately needs younger people because of its demographics, you know, so anti-migration? There are two things about migration. You put your finger on, on one thing which I didn't mention. I'm sorry it was in my talk, but it, one of the bits that didn't, didn't get said. Um, all countries need migration. I say all countries, uh, all developed countries. America needs a lot of immigrants. Europe, I mean, one of the, we see it with Brexit. The National Health Service is going to collapse. No one's going to be there to pick the strawberries um, in, in the, 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 the fruit in the orchards. Uh, it, it, it's complete lunacy. Um, so you do need my, uh, immigrants. And America could take many, many more immigrants than it does at the moment. Um, uh, I forget what the figures are, but, but Australia, I think, has 20, 28% of immigrants, in other words, in the population, it's something like one in four Australians was not born in Australia. They came in. Um, in America, it's very, very much lower, and in Europe as well. It could be much higher, and economically, it would make a lot of sense. Um, there, are, there is a limit, though. Uncontrolled migration uh, is not good for any economy. I mean, there is a, 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 a threshold which you uh, pass uh, at your danger. And there is a limit, a psychological limit, in terms of what the, the population that's already there is prepared to accept. So there's an economic limit and a psychological limit. Um, so it needs to be managed. But um, beyond what that, th where that threshold is, you do need to improve conditions. And most of the people who are who are trying to, poor people who are trying to cross the Mediterranean um, are very much unskilled. Uh, they um, are, uh, if they came by legitimate channels, and that's one of the things some of the European countries are trying to do, it, it would be easier. 
But they certainly, in, in psychological terms, most European populations, because, because it's uncontrolled, because they're trying to get, get in in an uncontrolled manner, do not wish to accept them. And that may be regrettable, but it's a fact which governments have to reckon with. So yes to immigration, yes to migration, but within limits which countries can accept. And beyond that limit, you have to try to make conditions better. And of course, the great problem is you can spend money in developing countries, and it won't actually change anything. How do you, how do you make sure that what you do is actually going to be effective? It's very, very difficult. Um, so, so that is a huge challenge. But it's not being met. And the climate change aspect of this, that we are going to have within the next half century probably quite large areas which, which will be more or less uninhabitable. That's going to you know, ratchet up the pressure. And again, for completely uncontrolled migration. So governments have to face this, is all I'm saying. And I think it's going to be a huge problem. Oh, and the young lady behind you actually wanted to talk too. And you next, if you can wait. <laughs> right. Thank you for your talk. Um, I was curious your thought on uh, the US system of having different states and state governments. Um, you talk about cleavages within Europe uh, between countries that are in the EU. Um, a lot of the discourse I've heard in the US is actually saying like we need uh, people who don't agree with the way that national politics are going are trying to work at the state or local levels. Um, and I think the increasing polarization in our country is to some extent geographically distributed. Um, so do you see uh, a future America that's less united with itself? As long as you remain a... You know, the, the powers of the states, yes, you're, you're quite right. You look at California, for example, with some of the initiatives that they have passed. Um, but nonetheless, an awful lot is decided in Washington, D.C., and you have a totally polarized and dysfunctional Congress, and have had for really quite some time now. Um, bipartisanship seems, seems out of the window. And I was talking about the American press uh, at the beginning of my talk again. Um, to stand back and try to be dispassionate uh, is, is not, these are not qualities which you see very much of, either on Fox News <laughs> or even in the New York Times. This is, this is what is regrettable, um, that you, you, you're seeing so little real analysis and thoughtful, thoughtful writing. Um, so yes, there are glimmers of hope in, in what may be done at the local level and in the States, and you come to somewhere like Hanover and it's absolutely wonderful. Um, you know, you, you're all very privileged. You live in a very nice, very nice part of America. And I've been talking about things which have struck me as um, admirable about American society. And I, I guess one thing I should have mentioned is trust. Uh, second or third day we came, we went out to Centauro and it was a holiday, public holiday, I can't remember which one. Um, the florist there, all the flowers were outside. They closed for the holiday, but all the, the you know, they had flowers and trees and stuff, um, which they left outside. You would never in a million years see that in Europe because it would be stolen. <laughs> Your newspapers, you throw onto the, onto the sidewalk. Again, they'd be gone. <laughs> <laughs> you have app boxes with Amazon and, and FedEx, and anyone could take those boxes. <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, it, it's very sad that this is not the case in Europe. I've seen in Paris fashionable stores with um, uh, flower boxes, and the flowers are wired into the flower boxes so no one will steal them. I'm not joking. <laughs> you know, these are, these are qualities which actually make life a lot, a lot more enjoyable and pleasant, and you have them, and, uh, and we don't. I mean, Europe is a lovely place to live, don't get me wrong, but <laughs> you do have tremendous strengths, so don't knock it. <laughs> you were going to ask a question. There was a variation on that question. And You've got I, a... I, I, 
variation on the last question, and I apologize because I arrived late, so you may have covered this, but the, the question of how, out, how others see America, do others recognize um, the difference between the two parties when they see America? Because uh, it's important. If you recognize that one party is a minority party that stays in power by generating fear, opposition, et cetera, et cetera. I, maybe I'm getting too political here. Any Republicans but, uh, in the room? I, like I'm quoting Norman up. Ornstein. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll make it a source. Uh, but there is a difference between the two parties, and, and there, are, there is an internal dynamic which is creating an America that now in power is displaying itself in a certain way. Well, I did. As I did. opposed to in the past, let me, sure. as opposed to in the past when they said, well, there's no difference between the political parties in America. I was going to make that point. Here. Uh, if you go back uh, 30 years, 40 years, yes, I did think, and many, many Europeans would have, would have said, well, Democrats, Repo Republicans, you're both kind of center as far as you, and then you would talk about left, left-wing parties in America, and we'd say, you don't even know what a left-wing party is. <laughs> um, th there was a feeling, certainly, that you were all much of a muchness between the Democrats and the Republicans. And that probably, well, did, it, did it begin to stop with Nixon? I, it's hard to, hard to know exactly when, but it, Nixon, then Reagan, um, uh, Jimmy Carter, perhaps. That, that general period, there was a sort of, beginning to be a division. And now, yes, absolutely, your, your Democrats and your Republicans are quite different, except on foreign policy and defense matters, where there is this national consensus which has not been shifted. NATO is good. America is there to promote its values, to, uh, to lead. Um, that, is, that has been your, for 70 years, that has really not changed. And it's not changed now. And we used to think, you know, okay, Americans are absolutely convinced of their own correctness, fine. That's probably a good thing, even if some of their policies are completely loopy. At least they have the courage of their convictions. <laughs> that, I think, that argument doesn't really hold anymore after uh, the last... 20 years or so. Good afternoon. Thank you for your comments, um, which I have to say I overwhelmingly agree with. That said, Thank you. Um, I'm married to the woman who lived in the UK for 20 <laughs> years. And um, I spent my professional career as a US lawyer in London. Right. So explaining US law to Europeans. It's quite a task. Um, to, or I should say to British and Europeans, or maybe mm. I should say to English people, Scottish people, and Northern Ireland, Irish people, and Europeans. Um, a couple of points. Um, first, I th I'd like to recharacterize a portion of what you said as not calling into question American exceptionalism but as calling into question American hubris. And I think, in my own way of thinking about these things, that there is a difference, that there are values that we as Americans stand for that are absolute in their character, that are virtuous, that we all too often don't live up to, but still make us as a society exceptional in historical terms. The, the simple way I would explain that to my children, and they're tired of me explaining it to them, but they're in their 30s, so they've gone off. Um, America is a country where a person comes and says they're an American. And there are a few other places like that, but very, very few. That's my first. I, I think there is virtue in some of our beliefs of liberty and equality. That's mm -hmm. the, the, the first point I want to okay. take a slight issue with. Um, 
The second, and this maybe brings me back into the hubris point, I speak by virtue of my profession, I spent a great deal of time responding to the assertion of extraterritorialism mm -hmm. and why do you get to assert it? And I, and I think the answer is there, there is quite simple, because we can. Yes. And, and that carries with it a responsibility, but it also carries with it a matter of fact. To put it in concrete terms, when I first came to Europe in 1991, you could not raise $100 million to finance whatever you wanted to finance, a road, mm. a, a building, a business, without coming to the United States. Mm. It could not be done. Mm -hmm. Now, $100 million is not a lot of money anymore in the, in the overall mm -hmm. world of finance. But at the time, it was. Mm -hmm. um, we asserted US law requirements on people seeking to come to the United States and raise money, the fallout of that was that the, speaking purely in technical terms, the financial market systems in Europe became substantially more robust and self-supporting. Right. Let me take your two points. So, um, so those are those are just two different points. Right. But no, I, let, can let, I just finish let, on the extraterritorialism? There is, as Kissinger said, there is. You know, countries don't have friends; they have interests. Yes. The notion that America asserts its interests shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. It's a question of whether it's short-term interests or whether it's long-term interests. And uh, one can argue really quite, quite forcefully that very often it's short-term interests. Let me, before I forget all your points, um, absolutely, on your second, you do it because you can. Great powers use their power to advance their interests. Completely agree. Um, uh, whether uh, there is the, the, the question of definition of interests. Up, up to now, most of the time, more or less, I would agree that uh, you, you, you have used your clout in ways that have advanced American interests. I think this is going to become more difficult for you. Mm -hmm. um, the second point, or rather your first point, but the one I haven't addressed yet, is about hubris and um, uh, exceptionalism. And there, I'm afraid I have to disagree. I think they are two different things. Um, hubris kind of compounds exceptionalism, but exceptionalism is a problem. Um, and you, you can continue to, I mean, you talk about uh, um, immigration, you come to America, you become an American. Um, that has always been the case. A bit hard to argue that in the age of Trump, <laughs> actually, when you close the border, when you banned, uh, banned people coming in, even this wretched mother who was coming to look at her dying toddler. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's applied very hopelessly, but, but it, you know, even if it were better applied, the desire to keep others out, that's a big change. Um, except the problem with exceptionalism, and it's, it's in the words themselves, if you go on thinking you're exceptional, then you are going to, it's, you know, it's like the kid in, in the group of kids in the playground. If you all play together, you're, you're all mates together, and you all get on, and someone is on top, and someone's underneath, and then it changes around, and it's another person on top, you're all in the same group. If someone says, I'm exceptional, you're not in the same group. And, and that, you've been able to do this because of your power, um, because other, other countries acquiesced. They were quite happy with this. It was comfortable. I believe that is, that is ending, and that you, there is a, a psychological transition, um, that's what I can call it, which will accompany the kind of real world economic transitions, geopolitical transitions that Americans are going to have to go through. And I, I think that's going to be terribly, terribly difficult. You know? <laughs> you don't give up something that you're really attached to, and you are attached to exceptionalism, without a lot of pain and struggle and strife. So that's what <laughs> I'm afraid. Anybody else? I think we have a few more minutes, but are there any other questions? We've
exhausted you. Well, thank you very much for coming. It was absolutely a wonderful Thank you very much.